Hello again, everybody, and welcome back to the IBS Freedom Podcast. I'm joined, of course, by the marvelous Amy Hollenkamp, RD. Hello. Remind the good people at home what your Instagram handle is, my darling. We're trying to get into the routine of this now. My Instagram, my Instagram, wow, handle is Amy underscore Hollenkamp underscore RD. There you go. And uh, I'm Nikki. My Instagram handle is gut.microbiome.queen. So I have dubbed myself the queen. Self-appointed title, but still, I think it's perfectly valid if you ask me at least. Uh, Welcome to the free slash cheap episode. Now, the laughable thing is every episode of this beautiful podcast is free to you folks at home to listen to. But in this episode, we're going to focus primarily on things that you could do for free or for really, really cheap that could help you either gather information and, and understand your body better or help you feel better. And these might be some really good starting points in your journey. Or honestly, if you're just fed up with spending a buttload of money and doing every test on planet Earth and having a supplement graveyard that's like taking up a whole cupboard in your kitchen, and it's just money wasted on the shelf that's just laughing at you now, this might be a really good thing to focus on for the next little bit of your gut health journey. And who knows, maybe these things will be enough that you could just get fully better and you won't even need to buy those expensive supplements again. Time will tell. Yeah. Whenever you hear the term free or cheap, I feel as though sometimes people equate that to not powerful or less effective versus throwing money at a problem. And in some ways, a lot of the cheap or freebies are going to be the most helpful for a lot of people with gut issues. So just because it's free or cheap uh, does not necessarily mean that it can't create a lot of major changes for you. Yeah. That's a really good point. And I want to make one other point. Please. Um, (laughs) Please. I'm a, Amy's on the edge of her seat now, just waiting Mm. for whatever I'm about to say. Um, There is one little difference though, that I'm going to share. Uh, You'll notice kind of a theme with some of the stuff that we talk about. I'm going to not talk about the free items that you might see in a Facebook ad or an Instagram ad or a YouTube ad or like a downloadable PDF or a downloadable ebook or a downloadable guide or a quiz that you could take for free. Basically, whenever you see that kind of stuff or like a free webinar, whenever you see that kind of stuff, that individual is trying to get your email address, and they're almost definitely going to sell you something down the road. Um, And it's not that that's bad, right? Like I do that. If you see me offering a free webinar, there's probably a 90% chance that it coincides with when I'm opening up FODMAP Freedom. And I want to also tell you about FODMAP Freedom at the end of the kick-ass webinar, right? So it's not that it's a bad thing to do a free webinar and then say, oh, by the way, I have this paid offering. Here you go. If you want more support, here it is. Um, and likewise, I've, I have some free downloadable ebook kind of things and downloadable guides. Um, it's not that that's a bad thing, but I'm just, I'm putting it out there that especially if you find something like that from a paid Facebook ad or a paid Instagram ad, the reason that creator is paying for the ads to run is because they're trying to get your email address and they're trying to ultimately sell you on something. So i I'm not talking about that particular flavor in this episode. We're talking about things that you could just go do right now or tomorrow uh, that are going to help you feel better. And you don't need to get on somebody's email list and do the whole rigmarole necessarily. Um, Mm. But yeah, without further ado, I don't know, uh, eeny, meeny, miny, mo. do you want to take the first one, my dear? And then we'll we'll go back and forth and take turns. Yeah, I wonder if it might be good to parcel to maybe think of categories of of things like some we can do that yeah because i think there's some that might help you with movement that are more free and i mean obviously the freest thing with movement would be like walking but like we could talk more about movement or stuff you can consume like nutrition right or or stress management okay i think that would be how i'd probably do it okay yeah so again i feel as though from a nutrition standpoint, there are, there are a lot of cheap things or, or things that you can incorporate in your diet that would be helpful 
um, with gut symptoms. I think probably the cheapest prokinetic that you could incorporate in is just ginger tea. And you could make ginger tea with ginger root. I actually have some clients that don't supplement with a prokinetic. Instead, they just do ginger a couple times a day and they prefer doing it that way. Um, I think chamomile is similar to that too. I know we've talked about that before, but like ginger and chamomile tea, and there's other teas too that would fall into this category as well. But utilizing herbs or medicinal type foods versus taking supplements can be a great way to cut costs. Um, and they can be equally as effective for some people. Yeah. Yeah, no, I love that. And we were just talking about a client of yours who's like on the fence of whether or not to take a prescription prokinetic for longer. You might not need the expensive prokinetics, either supplements or prescription medications. You might just get by with ginger. Um, right. It is. It's anti-inflammatory, antihistamine, anti, you know, anti everything. I think it has some antibacterial and anti candida kind of properties because it messes with biofilm stuff for the bacteria and the candida. And it's a really great prokinetic. And yeah, right. you can make it, you know, just go get a wad of ginger at the store. It costs what, four bucks, five bucks, maybe and you can make a whole giant vat of the stuff. Um, Mike and I actually will sometimes make a pretty concentrated ginger. I guess you could call it tea like a ginger decoction or something, mm -hmm. and we'll make it really concentrated and then put it in ice cubes. Mm. Or like we'll pour it into an ice cube tray and make these little concentrator ginger ice cubes. And then we can pull that out as we need it and add it to a little bit of hot water or cold water or whatever. Um, right. So you could even make it fairly easy to incorporate into your life, I would say. Um, chamomile also is a great one. It's prokinetic. It's also a great herb for helping just modulate the stress response and helping get you to sleep better. Um, you could start with the sleepy time tea sort of stuff, or you could get the real chamomile, like actual chamomile flowers you could get in bulk, even on Amazon. I think yeah. you could get a, a bag of them and it's maybe 20 bucks for a big bulk bag of a pound of them. And even if you just wanted to try it, I know that Frontier Herbs has a little bag that's maybe six bucks or something. Mm -hmm. I'll link that for some clients too, who just want to give it a try. They're not really sure. Yeah. But if they're going to like it, they maybe they've never tried chamomile, but if you mm -hmm. want to try a sampler style bag of it, I know Frontier Herbs has a bag of German chamomile, chamomile flowers that yeah. is maybe six bucks. Yeah, like an ounce or two or something. Right. So similarly, I think most bulk herb retailers, not Amazon, I think Amazon, it would just be like a pound bag. But if you do Starbucks Botanicals or Mountain Rose Herbs. I think a lot of them will have like a four ounce option and a 16 ounce option. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I like both of those. I was actually going to say too, my first one was going to be just tapping into the herbs and spices in your cupboard. Right. Because you probably have a lot of medicinal stuff laying around your house that you don't realize. Um, for one the majority of the herbs in your kitchen cupboard have carminative properties, which means that they can help kind of break up and dispel and soothe gas. So virtually anything in your spice cabinet would help with that. Um, as a side note, maybe less so mixes like Old Bay. Maybe we're talking more about a single herb at a time. I don't know if I would make a tea with Old Bay. That sounds kind of vomit worthy in my opinion, but you know, to each their own, who knows, maybe you'll love it. Um, but as some examples, I pulled up some notes from an herbal, uh, an herbal medicine lecture I took a while back. And I thought, just to rattle off rapid fire, a handful of things that you might not know about your kitchen cupboard. Uh, allspice can help with gas, nausea, vomiting, and it can help uh, with bowel spasms. Anise seed can help. It's a carminative and it's also a gastric anti-inflammatory. So that's pretty cool. Uh, basil can help with blood sugar regulation. Um, bay leaf can help with blood sugar regulation as well. And it seems to inhibit staph aureus and fungal infections when applied topically. So that's kind of neat. Uh, black pepper, really, really cool herb when you really research it, but antimicrobial, 
anti-inflammatory, carminative, again, meaning that it helps with gas and dispelling gas, um, can help with just enhancing digestion, diarrhea, nausea, motility, you name it. Uh, Caraway is really great, helps with dyspepsia, aka indigestion, nausea, vomiting. Um, And there's a name for this, I'm not, biliousness, I think is how it's pronounced, but it's basically that feeling that if you eat too much fat and you feel really queasy after eating fat, caraway can help with that. Um, I'll try to, I'll try to go a little quicker to some of the ones that are more popular. Cardamom also can help with motility and relief gas, nausea, vomiting, uh, cinnamon, great for blood sugar amongst other things. Clove. I think a lot of us know that because of its anti, uh, antibacterial and antimicrobial properties, but it's also a carminative, um, coriander also carminative. Um, let's see. Cumin can help with indigestion, diarrhea, gas. Dill is helpful for colic. Fennel uh, can be helpful, again, as a carminative. It can help with colic, indigestion, nausea. Uh, Ginger, we already talked about briefly. Uh, Let's see. Just a couple more for funsies. Marjoram. uh, In a randomized control trial, it showed to help reduce androgen levels in women with PCOS and help with insulin sensitivity. So that's kind of cool. And it also can be helpful for GI stuff in a similar vein. Uh, Nutmeg is really good for gallstone pain and gallbladder colic. So maybe if you have problems with the gallbladder or the ghost of a gallbladder that you once had, that could be an herb to work into your day. Um, And then a couple more parsley inhibits H. pylori and helps with healing the gastric mucosa in addition to being a carminative and rosemary, oh my God, if you look up some of the research on rosemary and your brain, it's pretty neuroprotective and amazing. But I don't want to bore us rattling off all of these different options. But, you know, case in point, you have a lot of power in your kitchen cupboard. And you could either put these herbs in your food, or you could make any one of them into a tea and just try it out as a tea and sip on it and see if that has any notable impact on your health. Yeah, I, I I love that you're talking about herbs. It reminds me of the conversation we had with Thomas. That was early, maybe in the 30s yeah, I think of, so. of the episode, somewhere in there. But um, not only do these things have awesome health benefits, but I think it's just an all an all around great way to add variety in too. Sometimes mm-hmm. when we think of building diversity in the diet, we're thinking of just like fruits, vegetables, or things that aren't something that you could throw into your cooking. Um, I remember when I was having gut issues, and this was more because I just didn't know how to cook, I would go to the grocery store and buy a new spice each time I'd go because I didn't want to go and spend a whole bunch of money at one time buying spices and herbs. So I would go and, and pick one that I didn't know much about. So... I would pick like parsley or something and I would go home and say, what is this mix well with? And usually I'd look it up and then I'd just try some different things and like yeah. hope it turned out. And usually it did. Um, funny enough with foods, it, as long as you paired stuff well, like if I was making a poultry dish or something, I'd try to pair the spices with pol- with that were going to be typically good with poultry looking it up on Google. So um, you're saying you didn't put like cinnamon and nutmeg on correct, your poultry. Correct. No, I would usually, I mean, who knows? maybe that's great. Right. Usually I would look online to see what would blend with the meat or the food that I was cooking or the vegetable I was cooking and try to add in herbs and spices to make it taste better that way. And, and it, again, surprisingly, most of the time it worked out, but that could almost be a fun experiment for you too, is when you go to the store try to pick out a few spices and herbs that you don't typically use as Mm -hmm. a way to add variety in and maybe add some health benefits. And then when you get home, you can look up recipes with that particular herb in them or try to find generally what foods they go well with. Mm -hmm. Um, I just thought it was kind of fun to do in general to mix up variety, especially when I was on a more restrictive diet. Um, 
So yeah, just an idea when it comes to incorporating the herbs. Yeah, I really like that, especially the bit about if you're on a really restrictive diet and you're bored to death with the food that you're eating, you know, maybe the answer initially isn't to add new foods in, but to add more spices and herbs. Um, And they have, they just have so much nutritional value to them too. Again, some of the stuff I rattled off, I know um, a lot of them are high in antioxidants as well. Mm -hmm. Um, And again, a lot of them have antimicrobial sort of properties, but they're gentle enough that, you know, it's not going to do any harm, right? There's a difference between taking five tablets of ADP oregano three times a day, Allison Seebecker, versus just putting oregano in your food, right? right? So I think that you could do this with no harm, no foul, and maybe it'll make your food more enjoyable and improve your health along the way. Yeah. Yeah. And I think um, there's definitely other things to consider that are free and cheap from a food standpoint. And, and it might even just be like changing your attitude around foods and opening up your diet and buying more foods that are just different than what you typically eat, whether they're herbs and spices or vegetables, fruits, that kind of thing. Um, one aspect too, when it comes to maybe trying to incorporate probiotics and prebiotics in, we could maybe talk through some options that would be cheap or I, I think of these as cheaper than doing a supplement <laughs> that you could kind of incorporate into your diet. Um, again, fermented foods, if they're tolerated, I think can be great and have been shown to increase diversity in the microbiome. Uh, so if you can kind of incorporate some of those options into your diet without having to supplement, that would be great. Uh, I think some people do great with eating fermented foods, um, and find, and sometimes you can even look for specific strains on certain probiotic foods, especially yogurt. It's not really typically, like sauerkraut or yeah, some of I the, don't... like Bubby's pickles, I don't think lists their strains because mm-hmm. they're more wildly fermented versus um, probiotics use specific strains. Yeah, versus like Dan and yogurt has right. one specific strain or, yeah. Right. Um, but yeah, I think most of the time, as long as you feel as though you can tolerate fer- fermented foods, I would certainly in- encourage you to eat them. And I think that they, they can be very beneficial to the gut. Um, and again, prebiotics too, thinking of, you could potentially try to think of some foods that have more punch when it comes to prebiotics compared to other foods. But I think generally just eating more fruits and vegetables and buying more fruits and vegetables is going to increase your prebiotic load. Um, well, and that could be a little bit more expensive than eating, uh, uh, very, uh, what's the word? I'm, packaged foods. It's been a day. I'm, uh, I can't think of the word packaged. That's okay. We love you anyhow, Amy. It's right. All right. But you know, it's might, there might be packaged foods that are cheaper, but in terms of being cheaper than buying prebiotics, get some prebiotics into your diet. You probably don't need the, the high flutin prebiotics, or maybe you use them like therapeutically, or something for a shorter period of time, but. Well, or I'll throw out one. Um, One of my earliest SIBO mistake videos on my YouTube channel was about PHGG. And Mm -hmm. it wasn't that PHGG is bad for SIBO and it was a mistake to take it. But my whole take on that was you're putting, you're putting in all of this effort to restrict your diet and do this unenjoyable (laughs) restricted diet, right? right? Like you're doing whatever SIBO diet you're on. And then you're paying extra money to replace the prebiotic that is now missing from your diet. Right. That never made sense to me. I mean, it, it kind of does. I get the idea behind it. But if you can tolerate prebiotic rich foods, you know, does it make more sense to just eat those foods? And be confident that you're not feeding the SIBO and wreaking havoc on your body. Like, does it make more sense to let go of that dogma and just eat the prebiotic rich foods or stay on your SIBO diet that people told you incorrectly is starving the SIBO and 
replace the thing that you're lacking. It's kind of it's kind of analogous to if you become a vegan and you realize that your diet is lacking in B12 and you take a B12 supplement, but it's like, or you could just eat some of the foods that have B12 or iron or zinc or whatever, right? You're, right. you're just filling in gaps of a diet that is not suiting you or serving you ultimately. So that's a consideration too, is that you could potentially save yourself a bunch of money if you don't need to do the supplements, if you just get prebiotics from your food, period. And there is a difference between, Mm -hmm. um, and this actually segues into one I wanted to share too. The segues into um, the, the distinction between people who are doing a diet like low FODMAP or SCD or biphasic, and they've tried to expand their diet and they're stuck there. Mm -hmm. That's a different situation versus people who are doing a SIBO diet, quote unquote, and nobody has led them through a reintroduction. Somebody told them erroneously that you need to stay on that SIBO diet for months and months and months. Like those people, one free, wonderful thing you could do is just start challenging foods and seeing if you can tolerate more of those foods than you realized. If somebody, t- if your functional medicine doctor or your naturopath told you you had to do the strict elimination phase of low FODMAP for, you know, six months or 12 months or whatever the case may be, or heaven forbid they told you to do it indefinitely, that's not how that diet's meant to be used. You're supposed to do the elimination for two to six weeks, and only if you feel better doing that diet then you start to systematically introduce foods and kind of test out what types of FODMAPs you have the most issues with and which ones you could tolerate just fine. And again, if you're doing a SIBO diet, quote unquote, or an IBS diet like that, and you don't feel any better from the diet, the recommendation from Monash is to just abandon the diet because it doesn't work for you and move on to something else. So there's probably some people listening to this podcast right now who are on that strict phase of low FODMAP, you know, they're buying the more expensive dressings and, you know, FODMAP brand, whatever this and that, and they're, they're tightening up their diet unnecessarily, and just giving them permission to try to experiment with things that that could be the ultimate free or cheap thing for them to do. Right, 100%. The PHGG and other prebiotics can help fill gaps in someone like you said, that can't tolerate a bunch of foods and it can fill that void. But in reality, the whole goal would be to get you to the place where you're getting your prebiotics from foods anyway, um, whether you need some extra prebiotics on the way to help support you or not. So again, if you can jump right back in that state where you can eat a bunch of different foods and a bunch of prebiotics, then that would be great. You could skip a step. And that would save you money and time and energy, potentially. So, yeah, I think you're dead on um, with that analysis. And again, broadening up the diet, if you can, is always going to be awesome for a number of different reasons. From a taste standpoint, from a nutrition standpoint, from a microbiome standpoint, there's going to be so many benefits of doing that. Absolutely. Um, Uh, Go ahead. I, I was just going to suggest one more within the world of nutrition before, I don't know if you're thinking of leaving this topic yet and branching out into other ones, but chronometer Yep. or, mm-hmm. or similar apps. I mean, there's, um, what my fitness pal, I think mm-hmm. is another one. I haven't used that one in a long, long time, but you could always do a little bit of nutrition tracking and guys, it's so easy and it's so cheap. The f- chronometer has a free version of the app. You could use it on your computer or you could use it on your smartphone and it's free. Right. You don't get much better than free. And if you want to be really bougie, you could do the the paid version of chronometer and get more data and it's like $5.99 a month. It's so cheap. It's so great. And you might just find some holes in your diet that you didn't know were there. You might be scratching your head wondering why all these iron supplements aren't working. And oh my God, I have malabsorption. And oh, oh, I have to get iron infusions. And my doctor doesn't know what to do. I have such bad malabsorption. But then you look at your chronometer data and you're getting enough iron, right? Right. So 
And honestly, if anybody has ever told you that you have malabsorption, do chronometer. Because I can almost guarantee you, unless you have raging untreated celiac disease or raging poorly managed or untreated Crohn's disease, I could almost guarantee you that 99% of you who have been di- told, I'm not going to say diagnosed with, 99% of the people who have been told that they have malabsorption, in fact, do not. You are just malnourished and you're not consuming enough of these nutrients. Yeah. Do chronometer, prove me wrong, but I can almost guarantee that 99% of you listening to this do not have malabsorption. You have malnutrition. Yeah. And a couple tips with chronometer too, as you're going through it, I don't think you have to be super regimented in terms of measuring everything out. You can eyeball some stuff, but try to make it, if you're really bad at eyeballing, you could baby measure. I wouldn't get that nitty gritty usually, but just eyeball some things, try to plug it in as accurately as you can. Um, but one thing to keep in mind, so chronometer, Nikki is raising her desk and she's doing hand motions. But um, I didn't mean to distract you. That was more for the well, people at home. But then you laughed and then we had to acknowledge it. Yes. Well, how did you not mean to distract me when you're raising your arms? <laughs> like you're doing magic. a dramatic Pinocchio rays, like you're controlling your desk with as a puppeteer. That's um, exactly what I was doing. But basically, I was just trying to say the chronometer. If you're plugging in packaged items, there I remembered how to say packaged. Um, if you're plugging in packaged items, it's typically only going to list nutrients in terms of micronutrients that are on the back of the package. So acknowledging that when you're going through the micronutrients is important because if you typed in, you know, Kerrygold butter specifically, it won't list all the micronutrients. But if you just type in butter, it'll list all the micronutrients. I think it's a really important tip if you're going to analyze the micronutrition with chronometer. Try to keep things as general as possible instead of getting really nitty gritty. Or if you if you use packaged items, just keep in mind that your micronutrition data, there might be some gaps in being aware of that. Again, usually if I look at someone's micronutrient data and I see what they've listed specifically, I can typically tally up like, oh, there's more thiamine in this food than, the, than what's showing up. So I can try to fill the gap somewhat in my head of, oh, they're a little low in thiamine, but these few foods wouldn't tally up any thiamine. So they might be good there. There Mm. can be some nuance when it comes to that, but I think the more general you can be, the more accurate the micronutrient data becomes. That's a really good and hilarious point, by the way, because (laughs) um, I, we briefly talked about this before we logged on. So I could, I finally got my husband to use chronometer a bit. And I've been telling him for literally a year and a half, like, oh, you probably have some stuff to work on, man. It's free. You can do it for free. And he finally uh, started logging stuff in chronometer and playing with it. And he's been kind of bent out of shape that he doesn't get enough fiber. And he's (laughs) previously, I think he was pretty well convinced that he got enough fiber and chronometer is showing him that he probably does not. But he started he started scrutinizing it. And one of the ones that he got bent out of shape with is we get this particular brand of pickles. It's like the Wegmans kosher pickles or something like that. It's I, I forget. But there's this one type of pickles. And when we log that on chronometer, we'll typically scan the barcode. Mm-hmm. And he was like, well, how do I not have enough fiber? And you know, you can click on each item, you can click on fiber to see where your fiber came from that day. And right. he clicked on it. He's like, the pickles I ate aren't on here at all. What's going on? And he's, you know, so he's googling and he's like, wait, according to this, pickles have I don't even know, like one and a half grams of fiber per however much I ate. And it's saying that I got zero grams of fiber. He was just on this tirade and it was hilarious to watch, but I was like, okay, so you maybe have another like two grams of fiber coming in that's not accounted for on chronometer, but you're still not hitting the mark, buddy. Like you still need to work on this. Anyway, it was just really funny. And I think that it was like what you, you said, if you typed in pickles and kept it really generic, 
maybe it would have that in there. But because we were scanning the particular brand of pickles, and there was zero fiber listed on the nutrition data, it just pulled that in automatically. So um, yes, my husband would attest to that. Keep it yeah. broad if you can. Um, and, and again, like you could do it for free or really cheap. And if you want really good data, you know, you could do just a couple days and get a ballpark idea of what you're consuming. If you want really good data, maybe do it for two weeks and then see if you can look at, I, I know at least for the pro version, I could go in and I could select the dates and put in a date range and then get the cumulative data, like the averages for that time period. Mm -hmm. um, and that was really insightful for me. A couple of years ago, I was wondering why my glutathione was low. And then when I posted a glutathione video on my channel a few months back, I did some chronometer tracking and I saw I did five months of collection in chronometer and it showed I was not getting enough cysteine. Right. Just, it, like all of the other amino acids, I was hitting it dead on. And then cysteine, I was at like 80% of my goal. And... <sighs> Lo and behold, and for those of you who don't know, cysteine is necessary to make glutathione. It's probably the most, most necessary of the three amino acids to make glutathione. And uncoincidentally, I started supplementing with N-acetylcysteine and had been doing so for a year or two. And then when I remeasured my glutathione, now it's totally normal and it's good. But I'm probably just filling the gap of that nutritional quirk. Even though I eat eggs, I don't eat them every single day. But it just, it looks like I don't hit the mark on cysteine regularly. So I need to fill that in a little bit with a supplement, perhaps. Or I just need to eat more eggs, I suppose. Um, right. But yeah, right. chronometer could be very insightful or something like it. But it's so easy. You can scan barcodes and it's there's a app on your phone. It, it does get easier than this, people. Back right. in the heyday. Okay, let me ask you this. To Okay. What year did you graduate dietetic school? I forget now. Like 2017? Okay. Yeah. So maybe... Wait, no, maybe... it was 2018. It was 2018. Okay. Well, it's hard because I graduated the school part, but then I had a year of internship. Oh, yeah, And yeah. I graduated the internship at 2018. Okay. I ask because you might, you might be fresh enough out of school. Like, did you have to manually do nutrition diary tracking and stuff when you were in school? Did you have to like take a handwritten diary and use a book to like calculate how many grams of whatever were in each food? Because we did that in, we had just, it was a nutrition class in grad school and we had to do something like that. We had to like go to a reference book. We had the internet just for the record. I'm not that old people, but we had a reference book and we had to like flip through and find eggs <laughs> And hand write, this is how much protein was in the eggs that this person ate. And this is how much fiber was in the carrots. And oh it was mind numbing. and It was hard. And now they have an app that just boop, 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 does it automatically for you for free. It's magic. Oh, my God. Well, I'm trying to think the, the most asinine thing. And I can't even remember it now because it was so stupid to me. So in dietetic school, there's for diabetes, they'll have you do like carb counting. I don't know if you've heard of that, but each carb, they'll try to stack things. So like one point will be 15 grams of carbs. Well, why can't you just measure 15 grams? Like they, they're creating another unit that's making it harder for people to implement yeah. stuff. Like to me, it's much easier to keep track of grams of carbs then putting things into like that's one carb point that's two carb points that's three carb point like you're you're creating another unit it's so stupid to me um it is. It, you're adding a layer of complex com right uh, right complexion? that's not what i'm going for complexity complexity there we go thank you yeah. see okay processed was your word of the day complexion complexity was my word of right. the day so we both we're even now um, yeah, but yeah, you know what it's that just, is maybe, maybe dietitians are trying to make it too hard, trying to make it well, hard. So that then they are needed <laughs> for, the, for the, for the consults. Well, actually it's funny you say that. So I was going to point out, this is nutritionism and honestly, yeah. everybody is so steeped in this and it's, it's maybe not serving us super well. Uh, 
I don't think he coined the term, but I first heard the term nutritionism from Michael Pollan. And it's this idea that you can't listen to your intuition and you can't listen to tradition and culture to tell you what to eat. You need experts and you need doctors and researchers and PhDs and RDs and nutritionists. You need the experts to tell you what to eat. And it's too complicated for the likes of us normal people. And if, you know, if you can't assess how much B12 you're getting, then, oh my God, what are you even doing? How do you even know if right. you're eating healthy? Um, but I always really appreciated Michael Pollard's earlier work, like his nutrition work, because he was so against that idea of nutritionism. He's he's always been a big proponent of just eat food, not too much, mostly plants. It doesn't have to be more complex than that. He has a really great book. I might even have it. I think I see it on the shelf. Hold on one second. Entertain the good people at home for 10 seconds, Amy. Ready? Go. Oh, Lord. Sing for them. Um, I really don't want to sing. I'll just... <laughs> She's back. Okay. Thank God. Did you sing? Did you no, sing? No, I said I really don't want to sing, and then you're back. Ugh, buddy, daddy. Okay. This, you could get this book for like $8 on Amazon. It's super cheap. Um, it, maybe it's even cheaper now. I don't even know. And it's little. It's, it's a quick, easy read. Um, it's called Food Rules by Michael Pollan. It's great. It's so good. Everything is super digestible, pun totally intended. So if you look at the rules, it's all like one page, one paragraph for each food rule. Some of them are super short, but he he kind of crowdsourced nutrition wisdom and put the best ones in this book. And they're mm. all rock solid, you know, stuff like try to shop the perimeter of the grocery store because that's where the freshest food is. Like all the mm -hmm. processed shit food is in the middle. Um it's not food if it arrived through the window of your car. <laughs> yeah, that, there's some truth to that. Um, eat, eat colors. Um, eat some foods that have been pre-digested by bacteria and fungi. So that goes back to the fermented food kind of thing. The whiter the bread, the sooner you'll be dead. <laughs> and then he elaborates on that. Um, but there's just, there's so much good stuff in here. Some of it's really humorous and some of it you know, it's just really practical. Um, avoid food products that make health claims, right? Because that's just marketing. Of course, right. manure usually. Um, there's another one. I think uh, you shouldn't get your fuel at the same place your car does. Is something to that effect. And I was amused right. by, you know, like the the peanut butter cups or whatever you get at the at the right. gas station. Um, but it's just it's a really nice kind of easy easy read and it's really practical down to earth advice. You don't need to know a damn thing about B vitamins or methylation or the microbiome or whatever. Just if you can follow some of those food rules and implement those into your life, um, that goes a long way. And he has some really great free lectures on YouTube. If you type in, you know, Michael Pollan food rules or Michael Pollan omnivores dilemma, dilemma, he did some public lectures at like Google and some other places. And you could listen to him lecture for an hour. And it's just so full of wisdom and so down to earth. He Michael Pollan could cure the world of food fear. That's what yeah. I think. I, I send his stuff to a lot of my clients who have a lot of food fear or a lot of like, nutrition dogma plaguing their brain where they're like, oh, I don't know if I should be low carb or vegan or low FODMAP or low histamine or low whatever, like, all the foods are bad for different reasons. I don't know what to eat. You know, when people are really freaked out by that sort of stuff and overwhelmed by all the different polarizing viewpoints on nutrition, I send them to my boy, Michael Pollan, either on YouTube or I tell him to get what this book. What if we got, had Michael Pollan on our podcast? Would you die? Oh my God, I would die. I would die so much. I mean, I've, this is, I'm living the dream. I have gotten to meet Emma from Therapy in a Nutshell. And mm -hmm. I was squealing on the inside the whole time. We got to have Jason Haverlack, the probiotic advisor on. And I was, again, squealing on the inside the entire time. Um, yeah, I'm just this this podcast is just self serving for me because I get to invite on all of my heroes. And I love it so much. Right. So help help us grow this podcast, share it with everybody, you know, for the rest <laughs> of your entire life. And that way, when we get to be a big enough name, we can invite my boy Michael Paul on, and it will be marvelous. 
Oh my gosh, love we it. We might be a little bit of a small fish in the, in the pond, right? Or a small right. fish in the sea right now. So I don't know if we could get Michael Pollard, but someday. Oh. Sweet boy. Yes, my sweet boy. <laughs> um, well, so moving on from food, I'm thinking of, I mean, I guess a lot of the lifestyle things in general are going to be helpful for so many different reasons gut wise i don't know if we have to segment them out too much but yeah you know there's so many great free resources online in terms of meditation hypnosis um like brain gut access support yoga classes fitness classes that you can do online um I know I had one client who sent me a list. He was really big on hypnosis and meditation on YouTube. Like he, he scoured YouTube and found his favorite channels. Let me pull it up. Cause I send it to people all the time. Um, Likewise. I'll look at something. Cause one of my FODMAP freedom students told us a list of some stuff. I wonder if it's the same well, person. <laughs> It might, maybe, it might be a little tricky for me to find so you can find it. If I may, I'm just going to go through some of YouTube and just rattle off a couple of great YouTube channels while you look for that. Because yeah, YouTube, it's free. Okay, Um, I found the list, by the way. Oh, okay. Well, give me a moment now. Yes. Okay, first of all, you all need to go follow Dr. Deneza, Gut Microbiome Queen on YouTube. She's super awesome. Uh, But seriously, I have a ton of free videos on that YouTube channel, and I go into topics similar to this podcast, uh, but in a different format. I've got a whiteboard. It's great. Um, So my channel is out there. Um, Again, the Michael Pollan lecture videos are fantastic. He's got a lot of them. I know Google, he did one lecture for them. Um, For fitness purposes, oh my God, I love the fitness marshal so much. (laughs) Think of the modern day younger Richard Simmons, but he's got moves. Like you want to see this guy dance at a club. He's got moves and he's hilarious and just current pop songs that he does dance videos to. Really good workout. Um, Therapy in a Nutshell, Emma's channel is fantastic. She has Mm. tons of videos on anxiety, depression, um, coping skills, resiliency, you name it. Oh my God, she's got videos on everything mental health related. Um, Another woman that we had on as a guest, uh, um, Jennifer Franklin, she has a channel called Don't Hate Your Guts. I don't know if she has a lot of new current stuff on there necessarily, but she's got some really good videos that she had put on that channel. Um, There's the holistic psychologist. I've followed her on Instagram before. I've, I've taken a peek at her YouTube channel. I don't know. She doesn't seem like a huge YouTuber. She doesn't have as much content on YouTube compared to Instagram, but that's another one that you could check out. Um, what are some other ones? What maybe share your list now and I'll look. Oh, Jason Stevenson, he does meditation type um, videos and he has a fabulous Australian accent. So Ooh. added bonus, you get to listen to his accent. Oh. It's amazing. Um, so the ones that in he he put some uh, like a little bit of a description with each of these, but the mindful movement is a YouTube account. He said, this is probably the gold standard. The focus is guided meditation, but there are also hypnotherapy sessions. With nearly 400 videos, there are many options for healing meditation sessions in lengths varying from 20 minutes to two hours. I use the videos regularly and have recommended them to others who have found them very effective. And the second one is Suzanne Robichaud, which I've actually used her stuff and really like her. I love her voice. Hmm. She's a hypnotherapist. Um, He's... describes the induction sequences and her best videos are long, effective, and deeply relaxing. I love, for example, her healing temple hypnotherapy session, which I've done and really like as well. Um, the second, the third channel is Heal With You. He says, Annie with Heal With You publishes guided meditations for vagal healing, epigenetic healing, sleep, anxiety reduction, ancestral healing, and so on. They are very well done. The fourth one he lists is called Generation Calm, guided meditation for various lengths for IBS, rest and digest, stomach healing, chronic pain, and more. The 30-minute acid reflux guided meditation is excellent. Progressive Hypnosis is his last channel he lists, and 
they touch on a very wide variety of subject matters, but does have quite a few healing hypnotherapy sessions. Sessions tend to be longer, he, he mentions. So those were the three. The Mindful Movement, Suzanne Robichaud, Heal With You, Generation Calm, Progressive Hypnosis. In terms of um, resources on Instagram, hmm. um, the ones that are popping up for me now are like all the anxiety accounts, just because those are the ones I've been following more so lately. But first, to interrupt, we have to tell the good people at home the most important thing on Instagram to follow. Us. Go find good boy. No, no, no. You conceited jerk. No. Good boy Just, Ollie. Oh, my God. I agree. Everybody, good boy Ollie's way better than us. Everybody has to go find good boy Ollie. He's on TikTok and Instagram. That is a therapy session. Just watching his right. videos, that is therapy right there in and of itself. Oh, wait. Now I have another. I actually have another dog one that's way better than us, too. Um his name is Petite Pokey, and he's a Boston Terrier who's like tiny. Petite Pokey, yeah, Petite Pokey, right. and he just has his owner like dresses him up and stuff, and does like really funny videos with him. But Petite Pokey is also a good dog, famous social media dog person. And Toby the Gentleman is also a famous. Uh, Instagram slash TikTok account for Boston Terriers. Um, excellent, excellent uh, for mental health. So I agree. Way I'm better than us. both of them right now. Yes. That was urgent. Um, there's one more. Brady the Corgi. I don't know if I've seen him. Go follow them. They're, so it's two. It's Brady and his brother Graffiti. Or no, his, his nephew Graffiti. And they're adorable and so floofy. And they bring I... you so much joy. There was another account too, and this one could be kind of like more emotional. Like sometimes I was like touched. There was a girl that worked, I think in Kansas City at like a rescue. So she would go, she would film herself most of the time being introduced to dogs that are very scared. And like, so you see the progression of them being very scared to trusting her and it was super cool. I also just get sucked into all the dog stories. Like when they find a dog on the street and then there's a progression of like 15 videos after the fact, I'm hooked. If you find a dog on the street or on the beach, you best Tag believe me. I'm going to watch every video about what happens to that dog. There was a dog that I got really attached to named Hippo that was like, a he might have been like part pit or something, but he was being fostered and this dog had the sweetest face you'd ever imagine. And then the foster was spoiling him to death. And everyone was like, you better adopt that dog. She ended up not adopting the dog, but everyone was like trying to guilt trip her. But I got so sucked into him. I'm a sucker to get sucked into any like positive dog story for sure. <sighs> but now but that we're saying there are some anxiety channels as well on Instagram. Yeah, right? I think if you're someone that struggles with anxiety, like a lot of my clients do, like I do, um, I've really liked some ch some anxiety pages lately. Anxiety Josh is really good. He has an accent and just his stuff tends to be a little different than some of the mainstream stuff that you hear too. Um, and so I really like his stuff. It's more about how to how to become comfortable, like changing your relationship with your anxiety. So I really like his stuff. And same thing with the anxious truth. I know that you follow him too, because you've sent me stuff. I think it's the dot anxious dot truth. Um, Something like that. He's really good. Um, the anxiety toolkit is really good. There's a lot of cool like anxiety people online. Um, Jenna Overball has some good stuff. So again, those people, if you have anxiety, um, but yeah, I, I think that those can be, Instagram can be good, usually, as long as you're not overly scrolling. Yeah, or, well, and I think it depends. Ironically, I feel like if you follow a lot of gut health gurus, that can do bad things for your mental health, right? Because then you you see one, all in the span of 30 seconds, you see one person making this amazing green smoothie. And you see another person doing an adrenal cocktail and you right. see another person with a, a supplement bottle and you see another person going on a 20 mile run 
And like, if you follow too many health accounts, and you're bombarded with their stuff all day, every day, you start to feel like you need to do all of those things. And it feels very undoable and overwhelming. So ironically, I would say don't follow a ton of health related accounts if you can get away with it. Mm, yeah. Um, Because I just I think that yeah, it's not going to do good things for you. But the mental health ones I like. Well, Another I, one that I like. Well, and I just to touch on that, I think if, if the gut related stuff, sometimes the degree of intensity and urgent nature that I see a lot of people posting, that's where I think it can get really problematic where people are saying you have to do this or you aren't paying attention to this. Uh, you know, it, it, I think that there's a level of urgency in the gut health social media space that's very non-productive. And I think that's what you're describing. Yeah. Um, and I'm trying to find, I think that these, yeah, there's two other ones that I followed recently. Sorry, I was listening to you, but I was also yeah. trying to find this. Uh, one that I think I might have mentioned before is that underscore meditation underscore guy. Uh, mm. He's really good. I actually took a meditation class with him. He does what it's like once a month over zoom, he does a small group meditation class. And I really liked it. I thought it was good. And his his feed is really nice to follow. Uh, another one that I just discovered more recently. Uh, it's all all one word, no spaces, no dots, no nothing. It's Dr. Chris Lee, D R C H R I S L E E. And he's pretty good. Just, I really like his stuff. It's all like neuroscience and stress management and and stuff. And it's, I don't know, I've really enjoyed his stuff so far since I followed him. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a lot of good stuff. Again, Amy underscore Hollenkamp underscore RD is fantastic. That gut microbiome queen lady is fantastic. But also go follow good boy Ollie immediately. Right. Like they're number one. <laughs> they're they're just, the they're list. another kind they're of They're another level. class. They're another echelon. Yeah. But that's why I wasn't even thinking echelon. of them. To we can't with. even touch good boy Ollie. Right. Um, but that's okay. We, we will admire from afar. Um, and YouTube channels. We already mentioned YouTube channels. Can I I'm mention not... a couple specific? Well, no, one you can't. specific free resource that you have created you lovely woman i have well one that i will <laughs> it's a resource that i will send to clients that you it's a specific youtube video that you have okay a, on your massage techniques oh, yeah. your massage technique videos are free and they're amazing and i've had a lot of clients who really like those especially if they're flared as yeah. something to try um Again, I just think they're really well done and they seem to be really effective. So if Thank anyone you. is wants to try doing a little bit of manual work on their gut and massage, learning some gut massages, check out your videos. You have one that's more for adhesions and ones that's a little bit more general. Yeah. I think it's a Mayan one. Yeah. Um, yeah. If you just go on my channel and search massage, right. two videos will pop up and they're both demo videos. So you, you can follow along as mm -hmm. I do them. Um, yeah. Side note, setting up for those videos was hilarious because I, f I filmed them and I wanted, I wanted the camera to be pointed down at my abdomen, basically. Mm -hmm. And I also needed lighting. So what I think I saved a picture, but it was so long ago now. Um, I had a, uh, what do you call it? A ring light. And I put my phone in the middle of the ring light and then I had it so that the ring part of it was cranked all the way down and that I had to tilt the entire thing forward like this. So I had a string or rope or something like tethered, holding it literally by a thread. This thing could have collapsed on me oh, at God. any moment during filming. And I had to have that and that I think I weighed it down with like a big jug of water or a bookshelf or something in my office, but it was such a precarious setup <laughs> trying to film for that. But again, I needed it to be pointed at my abdomen so that you could follow along with it. So it was just really hilarious. Oh my um, God. Trying to film for those two videos. <laughs> and it probably looked super awkward. If somebody had like walked into my office and found me filming these videos, it would have been really funny, but, oh. but it was worth it. Cause yeah, I've gotten a lot of really good feedback on those. I kind of forgot that they were there. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to point those out. Um, yep. Yeah. A couple other things 
um, that I think fall, well, I feel like a lot of the other, the stuff outside of the nutrition realm is more lifestyle in general, but walking, well, I think just getting outside in general, getting sun, connecting with nature, you could do grounding. I honestly think getting outside more is super healing and we probably don't even, and we'll never understand all the ins and outs of why it's so healing to be outside and to be in nature, but getting outside, sitting in the grass, walking, going to a park, playing with your kids, whatever it is, definitely getting outside even if on you a just regular sit on basis. Your front porch. Right. And you do even if you sit on your butt and you don't do anything active, just being outside and mm-hmm. getting a little bit of sunlight on your face mm-hmm. is for huge. circadian rhythms, vitamin D. Yeah. Um I remember even one microbiology guy he used to be all over the place, but he disappeared. His last name was Leach. Do you remember him? He was a scientist that would go and live with the Hazda tribe or something in Africa. And he would eat whatever they eat. He'd do like stool tests and stuff. Huh. And then he would come home and eat. He did a lot of stool. I should send you some of his stuff because I can't remember his his name, but I know I did some blogs where he, where I linked to him. So I will try to find those blogs. But I remember he said that even getting outside, if you're breathing in the air and breathing in, there's, there's bacteria and microbes all in the air. So if you're going outside or playing and sitting in the grass and you're just going outside in general, you're probably going to breathe in more microbes that could diversify or help out your microbiome. Yeah. Um, so that was like one of his takes that I was like, whoa, because he was saying just getting outside or opening windows is going to expose you to more microbes. Yeah. Um, opening windows? Yeah. You want to know some of the best detox stuff that you could do? You don't have to buy a detox shake or a detox tea or a capsule or a sauna or whatever. Open up your windows and get fresh air in your house. Mm-hmm. Keep the dust to a manageable level, right? Like vacuum and dust your house occasionally. Amy, you should really vacuum your house more often. I think we might benefit from less vacuuming. (laughs) We joke all the time. Her husband is obsessed with vacuuming. That is his jam. So Mm -hmm. that was intended for a laugh. Yeah. Um, But yeah, just vacuuming and occasionally dusting your house, Um, even decluttering your house. I think I've seen some research that decluttering can help lower stress levels because mm-hmm. you're not overwhelmed and overburdened by all your crap all the time. Right. But also it makes it easier to clean and dust your house. And it probably is helpful from a potential mold perspective too. Right. Cause I could say my parents' house, I love them to pieces, but Oh my God, they are cluttery pack ratty people. And they're not quite to the point of hoarders, but you know, they're inching their way there. And we have hemmed and hawed over whether or not they have a mold problem for a while, like various integrative doctors we've talked about this with. And I keep thinking, ooh, if we do confirm that there's mold in this house, it is going to be the biggest headache on planet Earth because there's so many nooks and crannies where the dust and the mycotoxins can settle on stuff and just, oh my God. So if you can keep your house less cluttered and less dusty and less filthy, um, not only is that good for your mental health and your detoxification pathways, but also heaven forbid, if you ever did have a mold problem and you had to clean up and remediate, it would make that process so much easier. Right. 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 Yeah, no, that's such a good point. And so many great tips. One, this is a joint tip to think about, because there's multiple ways that you could do it. But connection in general, connecting with people, hold my hand, Amy. Hold my hand. Oh, hi. (laughs) Connecting with people, connecting with things you love, connecting with nature, we talked about. Um, but like cuddling more, making it a priority to cuddle more or to like kiss more or pet your dogs, cuddle with your animals, all those things I think we sometimes take for granted or just get sidetracked and aren't doing at different times. Um, but 
even just like five minutes of cuddles can do wonders on your nervous system. Even if you're watching TV or something, try to hold hands. Um, it's funny. My father-in-law is like really sweet and he'll always get like scared when we watch movies and he'll like want to hold hands. It's the, it's very sweet. He'll be like, I have to be him. He sounds so cute. He'll say, hold my hand. I'm like, I'm scared, you know, like. Oh, it's so sweet. He's, he's precious. He's, I've never met the man, but he just sounds so precious he from everything is I've a, heard. He is a Persian treasure, and he needs to be um, saved Point at all bubble. costs. He needs yes. to be protected at all costs. Um, but yeah, he it, it it just cracks me up. Like he's very touchy. It's funny because Armand's family is like very much more touchy feely, and my family's very German stoic. So, um, but in general, like I would consider myself more affectionate and cuddly than my family in general, but I don't know. Maybe we're all just wired that way. The, the German side just sort of takes over. Or maybe like, behind closed doors, there's a lot of canoodling you oh don't know about. Maybe God. they just don't like canoodling in public, Amy. I think I'm going to die. <laughs> 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 I think I'm going to oh. like throw up um but speaking what of, herbs did i say were good for nausea and vomiting <laughs> damn it let me get the list what herbs caraway oh get some caraway god. in you lady oh, oh my, my god yeah but <sighs> look now she can't even process now i'm my brain just i've mushed. fried her brain yeah um i think again going back to movement and outdoors briefly yeah, I think connecting with people is great. Heck, Eva, did you know that meetup.com still exists? Last I knew, it still exists. It's a thing. Or honestly, when I moved to this town, so we had lived in Chapel Hill previously for like, I don't even know, like five, six, seven years. And when we moved down here to Holly Springs, it was just far enough away that we kind of have to make all new friends and all new acquaintances and find new doctors and whatnot. Uh, one of the things I did maybe a month or two after we moved to this town, I was like, I'm going to go to a business networking group. And oh I told like, I was like, I don't really need the business per se. And I doubt that any of these people are like my target demographic that I, ch right. I try to serve in my business. But I just want to meet some adults that are not you. I right. talked to my husband who I love dearly. So I just, I went for the heck of it. And yeah, like I passed out a couple of business cards. I don't think anybody you know, came to work with me or anything. But, you know, I was telling people, hey, I've got a podcast, I've got a YouTube channel, I've got a lot of free resources, here you go. But just mingling with people and, and meeting some business owners was really nice. So that's yeah, a free or cheap thing you could do meetups. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sometimes yeah. mom groups try to get meetups together or play dates together. Mm -hmm. Or you could propose it if you're in like a mom group, that's local. Uh oh, it um, says my battery's running low. My husband okay. unplugged me. Let me. Way to go, Armand. Um, Way to go. Well, I feel like we have, we've hit a lot of the really good things. Um, I think, again, there are some free and cheap things that you should take with a grain of salt or approach with a little bit of caution. Oh my goodness, what are you doing, woman? I'm here. Amy is MIA right now. Um, I will, I will throw this out there. Another, another, uh, I, I'm, I'm not even going to process what Amy's trying to do right now. I think she's trying to plug in her computer and verify that it's plugged in. Um, another thing that we harp on all the time, but I'll just mention just because it's free doesn't mean it's the greatest thing. So be really careful with Facebook groups. Oh, okay. Again. We're good. Oof. Okay. Well, you missed. I was just throwing Facebook groups under the bus for the eight millionth time on this podcast. <laughs> okay. Okay. I, we just talked about this before we hopped on. So Facebook groups and Reddit threads and forums can probably be moderately helpful if you have a specific question. And you go in and you either ask your specific question or you use the search feature and you find a post where somebody else asked your question previously. Mm -hmm. That kind of stuff I think can be somewhat helpful. But if you're just constantly bombarded by the thread of all the stuff. Oh my gosh, it is overwhelming. I just I popped into one of them earlier today for for funsies. And there somebody was asking about toxic bile. And it was the most 
hogwashy pseudoscientific <laughs> infographic I ever did see. And you know that these people are all going to freak out and start talking about toxic bile. That's going to be the new thing. Everybody's going to be talking about toxic bile at this at this point. But if you're constantly bombarded with the thread of stuff in your newsfeed, that I think is really detrimental to your health. If you're a member of these groups and you just unfollow them and you pop in only when you need something really specific, I think that is a better way to use those groups. And keep in mind, like you're going to get all sorts of different opinions. So you could post what's the best diet for SIBO? And you're going to get everything ranging from carnivore to keto to vegan to low FODMAP, SCD, biphasic, fruititarian, I don't even know, like low oxalate, low histamine. You, everybody has an opinion. Mm-hmm. And everybody is desperate to share that opinion with you. True. And not all of their opinions are correct. And not all of these people, few of these people have any sort of nutrition or medical or health background. And that's not to discredit what what they can bring to the table, but it's just to say that it's it's still not a perfect system when you have specific questions because you're probably going to get a lot of horse manure question answers to your right. question. So right. um, beware of the free Facebook groups. Again, sometimes they can be useful for really specific things. We were just saying earlier, I think Reddit maybe is a little bit better of a tool sometimes than the Facebook groups. Um, but But yeah. Can you think of any other freebies that we've left out? Movement? I don't think so. Again, walking. Well, let's remind the people briefly. To walk. I always forget. Is it? Well, yes, go walk. Um, I always forget. Is it walking before a meal or after a meal or both that helps stimulate bile flow? That is walking before. I think walking okay. after has a little bit more benefits, maybe blood sugar, but maybe even walking before has blood sugar benefits too. I'd imagine it, it probably does. does. Um, yeah. but I know that the hack your gut guy talks yeah. about how there's the study where some movement prior to, uh, eating stimulates mm-hmm. bio, which would make sense from an evolutionary standpoint that we would have some processes that get upregulated by movement. Cause we used to have to imagine this, go and hunt our food. It wasn't just delivered mm-hmm. in the supermarket for us. <laughs> I'm just, I'm trying to imagine that. And I can't wrap my head around I that. I know. Um, but I do have to wrap up here too. Okay. That, I don't think I told okay. you that prior to our we shall. jumping yes, on. Yes, we, we shall. I think that's a good point anyway. But yeah, just movement, get outside, connect with people. The nutrition stuff we talked about, some of the mm-hmm. herbs in your kitchen cupboard. Oh my God. There's so many free or really, really, really cheap things that you could do that will help just help you understand your body and get it to where you want it to be. Um, Because presumably it's not where you want it to be if you're listening to our podcast right now. So I hope these free things help all of you. And we will see you in the next episode right back here on the IBS Freedom Podcast. Toodaloo. (laughs) 